Act 3, Scene 1. Now, before we get going too far into this, I want to focus on that literary element underneath the building background called foil. You should have this on your list already. If you don't, you'll want to put it on there. Um, this is a word you might not have heard before, but the concept is not or should not be too difficult to understand. Um, the definition really explains about as good as I can. You know, it's a minor character whose attitudes, beliefs, and behavior differ significantly from those of a main character. Usually these differences, usually these traits of this particular minor character are mere opposites of the main character that we're studying. And so our main character, Macbeth, um, there will be more characters sprinkled throughout these next couple acts that will surface as marked foils for Macbeth. Okay? And they have these traits that this individual lacks. Okay? Or if it's a bad character, the bad main character, what are those traits that make that person bad? The foil probably doesn't have those traits, okay, if that makes sense. Um, so it's really nice definition here. Foils are pretty simple. Um, in the, you know, as people start to, uh, you know, uh, new characters come out, um, not really new characters, but more developed of some of the minor characters, I think we'll have a, a better appreciation as to what the, what the foil, uh, foils are for this particular piece. Um, Act 3, Scene 1. Uh, the conclusion of Act 2 saw Duncan dead, saw Malcolm and Donald Bain uh, flee. Uh, one goes to England, one goes to Ireland for their protection. Uh, we see that the, uh, Macbeth has been um, named king and he was going to schoon in order to be crowned. We see that Macduff wasn't going to go and be supportive for whatever reason, whether that was jealousy or um, you know, maybe he's still in shock or he doesn't trust, or whatever it is. Um, he chose not to go. Um, and so time has passed. Um, now we have Macbeth as king. I want you to keep an eye on Macbeth's uh, demeanor, how he composes himself. He's king, a king now, so is he acting kingly? Um, do we see some of his earlier traits from Act 1 pop up where he's very you know, heroic and and people look up to him? Or is he more of the second act where he was kind of whiny and, and confused? Is he something completely different? Kind of paint a picture as to what that truly, um, what that truly looks like. Um, Banquo starts off with a minor soliloquy here right at the beginning. Um, and in it, again, soliloquies, you know, these are pretty much inner monologues coming out. And he's starting to question Macbeth's role in what happened, whether he did something for it or whether it was just dumb luck. But he's having thoughts in his mind. Um, and then Macbeth is going to uh, talk with him and finally get that opportunity that they've been putting off for a, a while, since Act 1. Um, but then ultimately Macbeth has a meeting with a couple individuals. What is the purpose of this particular meeting? Act 3, Scene 1. Uh, Banquo, we get to hear his inner monologue a little bit here with the soliloquy. Um, Thou hast it now, King Cotter Glamis all, as the weird women promised. And here's where we really hear and understand what he's thinking. And I fear thou playest most foully for it. Foully for it. So he thinks that Macbeth did something. And so when Macbeth comes in and they have this scene together, Macbeth and Banquo, you can imagine the tension, the perceived tension, because both individuals are having bad thoughts about the other person. We don't know about Macbeth yet, okay? But now that we're coming back and looking at it, this should be a lot more tension, okay? Walking on eggshells, trying to figure it out. Um, if you've seen uh, the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith with uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, they're married uh, spies. And there's a scene when they finally figure out that both of them are spies and that they are trying to kill each other. And they're serving dinner and, every, and they're just kind of, you know what I mean? Those that have seen it, they're just kind of back and forth, just kind of slowly cutting their food, wondering if it's poison, doing, just kind of feeling them out to see if it's true. It's really one of the best scenes in the movie. It's a good movie. Um, but here, these individuals here are back and forth, back and forth as well. Um, and it's kind of interesting because the way that Macbeth 
elicits some responses and some answers from Banquo. It's kind of clever. Um, 353, um, he says, uh, Macbeth goes, ride you this afternoon? Aye, my lord. So you're going riding? Good. Well, come back because I, I want, fail not our feast. So come back for our feast. You know, we're going to eat tonight. So this afternoon while you go riding, come back for our, our evening feast. Oh, my lord. I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be there. That's fine. Um, uh, Macbeth, you know, we hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, but filling their hearers with strange invention. So, Banquo, we found out where the killers are. And what do you think Banquo's mind's thinking? Mm-hmm. Sure. Right, I hear you. But instead... You know, Macbeth is pushing on, pushing on, trying to paint this picture. They had nothing to do with it. And they're not over there. They're not out there, um, you know, talking about how they killed their dad. They're over there spreading false rumors about what happened in Scotland. Um, so they're not preaching their, you know, their guilt. They're, they're preaching their innocence and spreading, you know, whatever. Um, his last line to Macbeth there, uh, to Banquo, excuse me, on line 35, he goes, Oh, I do, till you return at night, till you come back at night. Um, go flyance with you? You see how sneaky this guy is? So is your son going with you? I'm just, just kind of curious. No, no, you know, there's no ulterior. I'm just curious. Is Flyance going with you? And ultimately goes, I, my lord, he is. Well, then you guys have a safe trip and a safe ride. Everything's great. I will see you tonight. Right? It's one of those things. So he leaves, and Macbeth now has another soliloquy. This is his soliloquy where he figures out, well, not he figures out, but he conveys to us exactly what he's thinking. Um, uh, da -da 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 you know, our fears in Banquo stick deep. Banquo is the only one who can unravel this. Okay, he is the only one who heard about, who was there with the Weird Sisters, who knows about it, because Macbeth hasn't told anyone. Well, he told his wife. Yeah, but that doesn't count. Okay, obviously he told his wife. Okay, Banquo hasn't told anybody. Um, and he knows, it, it's kind of like uh, tying up loose ends. Have you heard that phrase before from movies? You know, anybody that can, can connect you to the crime, they kind of start to disappear to protect yourself, covering your tracks. Okay, in essence is what it is. Um, the purple there. There is none but he whose being I do fear. And under him, my genius is rebuked, as it is said, Mark Anthony's was with Caesar. So he's repressed, he's held back, he's, he, he can't commit completely to being king, to doing what he wants, because he has heard this, um, you know, not hasn't heard, but he's witnessed this, uh, this thing with Banquo, and so he's still fearful of it. Um, he's breaking days, like, you know what, my prophecies have come true. So if my prophecies have come true, whose else are probably going to come true? The only other person, right? That's Banquo. And so if Banquo's come true, let's see, what were his? Let's see, you're not going to be happy, but you're going to be much happier. And ultimately the one was, uh, you will not be king, but you will have kings. Now they didn't say your son will be king, but your heirs will become king. And he said, they said nothing about me. I don't have an heir, which is interesting because remember how Lady Macbeth says, I have given suck and know how tender it is to milk the baby, you know, love the baby that milks me. So She's had a kid before. Maybe something with SIDS. Maybe the child just died. Maybe, maybe there was something. Okay? But uh, this is one of those times I'm like, maybe there's a contradiction. Maybe, it, maybe he does have a little girl, and that's not going to be an heir, and he knows that. It's just never that big of a, a plot point to establish that they are, you know, have children running around the, the castle and such. Um, but ultimately, you know, I have to do something because um, the top of 355, it says, the seeds of Banquo King. So I must do something about that. So what does he do? He sets up a meeting with some characters. Look at those character names. They're not something that you would name normal people. They're called first murderer and second murderer. What do you think their profession is? Okay. He's enlisting these hitmen, these assassins, to take care of Banquo. And not just Banquo, but Flayance. And it's really kind of brilliant to see Macbeth, you know, he's making these choices. Lady Macbeth knows nothing of this. He's making these choices to help cement their future and their legacy. Um, he tells them stories on 355. He paints them a picture about how uh, you know, Banquo has wronged you and how Banquo is your enemy. And, and brothers and, and friends, 
If he is your enemy, he's also my enemy. I, your king. See how he brings himself down to their level to speak with them? They probably would do a lot more for that individual than if he was up there, I want you to kill him. But now he makes them take ownership of wanting to kill them. Them being uh, him, mainly Banquo. Now he pretty much says, you know what? There is a child, Flance. His death is as important, if not greater, than you know, than the father's death. Um, Flance's son that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Okay, so after a page or so of you know, uh, Banquo being, um, you know, painted as a villain to these individuals. Remember when Banquo wronged you and yours? Yes, well, we hate Banquo. Now I want you to kill him. And I want you to take out his son for me. Aye, it will be done. Okay. So we see Macbeth making plans. We see Macbeth doing what needs to be done in order to keep his future and his destiny rosy and pretty. Lady Macbeth is nowhere here. So, do we see a change in him? Yeah. We don't see the sniveling coward from earlier. We see a completely different person who wants to retain and hold on to uh, that power and such. Uh